All right, everybody, welcome back to class. Today, what we are going to do is continue our discussion on mechanisms for injury at the knee. What we're going to do today is continue to use vector addition to understand how potential injuries or pain could happen at the knee. Um, there's one uh, woman in the gym that I work at, and she's trying to um, work on weight management. And she's walking every day on a treadmill. And over the last couple of days, she's been like rubbing her leg and she's obviously in some pain. And I asked her what the problem was. And she says she feels like it's her kneecap. And so it was kind of interesting that we're talking about poor patellar tracking in these lectures. So I showed her the last lecture and on YouTube and she could relate to it. So I have her foam rolling. I have her thinking about maybe getting orthotics. I have her um, just mindful of the way that she's walking. I have her, um, you know, just resting in between bouts of walking and stuff. And so I just, I, th I think that these are um, functional or relevant uh, discussions to be had. So what I'll do is I'll share my screen right now. All right, so we started talking about the knee, and as a quick review, we started with the muscles of the quadriceps and how those muscles interact with each other. So I'll show you just the uh, the slides that we talked about yesterday. So here we have, let me get rid of this so it's a little bit clearer. So here we have uh, a number of different forces acting together. So right here, you have your kneecap, all right? That's your kneecap right here. And your kneecap is attached to your patellar tendon. This is what is right here. And that patellar tendon is attached here to the tibial tuberosity. And you have one muscle here pulling in this direction. That's your vastus medialis. And you have another muscle pulling in this direction here. That's your vastus lateralis. And then you have another muscle pulling in this direction here. This is your vastus intermedius. All right, so it would be like if I had, um, if I had one person um, playing tug of war and you had this person here, and this person is the only person on the side of the rope, all right? And they're pulling a rope here. And then you had some type of like situation where the rope got pulled by two people here. All right, so this is John over here. And this is Zach over here. All right, so now if John and Zach were pulling with relatively the same amount of force and they were pulling in the same angle. Um, now, obviously this is Zach here and this is John here and Zach is pulling, you know, in this direction, 45 degrees to the right of this knot here. And John is pulling 45 degrees to the left of this particular knot right here. Well, the resultant force, combined force of John and Zach pulling would be the added vector that you get from each of these two red lines. And it would be something like this. If you did parallelogram vector addition, it would be something like that. And this line right here would be the combined effort of John and Zach. And you can see if Zach pulls in this direction and John pulls in that direction and they're relatively the same magnitude of force, the added vector is also vertical. And it's about the same length as this vector here, which represents Jose pulling in this direction. And because of these combined forces here, it doesn't seem like there would be too much movement of this knot in one direction or the other. But let's say, for instance, you had um, 
a situation that looked like this over here. But let's say what would happen if Zach was all of a sudden pulling in this direction with a huge amount of force. All right, Jose, if Zach was pulling in this direction with this amount of force, what do you think would happen with this knot? What do you think would happen with this tug of war um, contest here? All right, so it will probably move up. If Zach pulls up, obviously he has more force than us, so the knot will probably move towards his direction. Upwards and to the right. Is that fair to say? Yeah. That's exactly what would happen. So if we do our vector addition, and I'm going to erase this too. I'm going to erase this guy here. So let's say you have these two different forces. Well, if you add these two forces together using parallelogram vector addition, all right, you would start at the head of that arrow and you would make another line that is equal and opposite. That's probably pretty good there. So this vector is supposed to be the same length as this vector and also parallel to it. Then you take another vector and you add it to the head of that arrow and you make it equal and opposite to this vector. And then you're gonna add them together. And when you add them together, you'll notice that the resultant vector is in this direction here. So as obviously this added vector here is longer than the force that Jose is pulling in. So this magnitude is bigger. And because Zach is pulling at a greater magnitude than John, the result is that this knot is going to move up into this direction here. And Jose is, or whoever's on this side, I believe it's Zach at this stage of the game, Zach is going to win this tug of war contest. This is called concurrent forces. And instead of thinking about it being tug of war, all right, here you have the patellar tendon is holding the kneecap in place. And then through the quadricep tendon, you have these muscles that are pulling on this patella. Now, if these muscles are relatively the same strength, then the resultant pull on the patella is going to be more in a vertical direction. And what that's going to do is that's going to make it so that you have your tibia here. And then you also have your femur. Your femur is going to go up like this. You get your femoral head here in the acetabulum. And it should be the case that your kneecap, when your quadricep fires, your kneecap is going to go up and down in somewhat of a vertical position. Because here on your femur is your patellar groove. And you want the kneecap to track up and down in somewhat of a, a rectilinear fashion. But if this muscle gets too strong or is much stronger than the vastus lateralis, then what's going to happen is your kneecap is going to get pulled towards the stronger muscle. Your kneecap, rather than tracking in a straight line, is now going to come up and it's going to have more of a curvilinear trajectory here or a curvilinear motion. And what that's going to do is it's going to make the kneecap pull up and over the patellar groove on the femur and cause potential pain. That could potentially wear down the patellar groove, and it could also potentially make it so that the sub-patellar surface gets irritated. And I would say that it seems as though this is what is happening with my boss walking on the treadmill. All right, it could be the case that her vastus lateralis or vastus medialis are at different 
strengths, pulling the kneecap towards the direction of the stronger muscle and interrupting its natural ability to track in and out of that patellar groove. Eventually, if she keeps walking and doesn't do anything about it, she could wear down the bottom surface of her kneecap. And then we studied Wolf's Law. Any bone that's under increased force and pressure is going to start to try to like grow or lay down more bone in order to deal with that. So it could be the case that the subpatellar surface, so you have a kneecap that looks like this. Because the kneecap is making contact with the bone of the femur, the kneecap could potentially start to overgrow. And then eventually what will happen is maybe the kneecap will start to grow a little bit more bone underneath it, right? like as a callus, or if the bone can't keep up, let, let's say uh, my boss is walking, you know, uh, 20,000 steps a day, and this breakdown of the subpatellar surface is happening at such a great rate, it could be the case that the, the bone just can't keep up with the amount of wear and tear on it. And then eventually what happens is the subpatellar surface starts to deteriorate. Something like this could potentially cause a significant amount of, of knee pain at the patellar. This could be one potential mechanism for injury. An imbalance in forces between your vastus lateralis and vastus medialis muscle that is resulting in a, um, a curvilinear translation of your patella up and over the patella groove and causing some type of bone, either growth or deterioration. Let's show another mechanism for injury that's associated with the patellar, but also that uses vector addition, but is a little bit of a different example. It's called your Q angle. I don't know if anybody knows what a Q angle, but a Q angle is a line that goes from your ASIS, anterior, superior, iliac spine, to the center of your patella. This is your anterior, superior, iliac spine. All right, and this is the center of your patella right here. And you'll notice that that isn't 100% straight up and down. There's usually a little bit of an angle here. It could be about 15 degrees, maybe 20 degrees for, for females, or maybe a little bit wider depending upon the structure of your hips. So your quadricep muscle is gonna come down here. This is gonna be your vastus lateralis. And then you have your vastus medialis right here and we won't draw the vastus intermedius all right and then you have your kneecap and your patellar tendon here so let's just draw in the kneecap and your quadricep tendon now this muscle here is going to be pulling somewhat in this direction here and your vastus lateralis is going to be pulling in that direction there all right, but what happens if, say, for instance, this angle is a little bit greater? All right, so now what we have is we have an ASIS here, and we have the middle of my patella here. Now, what would happen if this here, if your hips were a little bit wider? So right here, you see that this is relatively vertical, and if I add in what the the muscles would look like, the muscles are somewhat like this. All right, and they're pulling in this direction here. All right, and now I have my kneecap is here, and my kneecap is pulling down in this direction. Now, if this, if this angle here gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so let me, oh man, it's just, let me undo this. Let's just overdo it.
so now all of a sudden this ASIS, once I'm, I'm trying to make it so that this angle here, maybe this is the easiest way to do it. Instead of the Q angle being in this direction here, the Q angle was wider. It was like in this direction here. So I'm trying to draw, with this drawing here, I'm trying to make it so that this Q angle in this direction here, sorry, from here to here is a, is a greater angle, is more like that. Then what's going to happen is, although the muscles may still be the same magnitude, all right, let's say these muscles here, might still uh, undo that. It gets complicated. Lots of things to do with your fingers. This muscle here and this muscle here may be the same magnitude. They may still be pulling in this direction and in this direction with the same force. But because this Q angle is greater, rather than the muscles pulling in a vertical direction here, they're still being pulled towards, towards the side. They're still being pulled rectilinearly because the actual angle or the bony structure is different. I don't know if this is if this is doing it such a great job. Let me try to do one more time. Undo. Let me try to clear clear all drawings. Let's do this. Let's see if I can do this. So let's say this is my femur here. This is my femoral head. This is the same femoral head. All right, and then this is my acetabulum on this side. My acetabulum. Like this. And same thing here. And you have the muscles here. This is with a Q angle greater than 15. This is going to be greater than 15. And this is a Q angle of about 15. At first, when we talked about vector addition, it was because one muscle was pulling, all right, more forcefully than the other. So this muscle here is pulling more forcefully than this muscle here. And if that's the case, the kneecap is going to get pulled towards the stronger muscle causing poor patellar tracking. But with a Q angle, we're not really talking about that, that problem. When the Q angle is wider, you could have these muscles here still pulling in the same, with the same magnitude, but because the direction of pull is changed because of this Q angle, you're still gonna get a curvilinear translation of that kneecap up and over that patellar groove. So one mechanism of injury at the subpatellar surface could be an imbalance in forces between the vastus lateralis and vastus medialis, all right? And if that's the case, then the subpatellar pain is going to be caused by one muscle having a greater magnitude of pull than the other. So this is one mechanism of injury here. In the case of a changing Q angle, now the Q angle could change because of the angle of the femoral neck. It could change because of, because of um, the wideness of hips or the deepness of the acetabulum. In any event, it could be the case that these muscles here are pulling 
with the same amount of force, but the added vector between these muscles is now pulling the kneecap towards this direction further and further. And if that's the case, you're still going to have this potential change in the, the, the pull or the direction of pull of the, the patellar through that femoral groove. Now, these are very different mechanisms of injury. One is associated with imbalance in muscle forces, and the other is more of a structural issue. But the result of those two kinesiological, I guess, irregularities um, are potentially similar. In the case of the Q angle being uh, greater than 15, would we want to encourage, I guess, uh, one muscle pulling with greater magnitude be to offset that Q angle? I mean, I guess from a physics perspective, if you're just looking at, um, you know, the magnitude of two forces added together, I think that would probably help somewhat. Now, whether or not as a personal trainer, I want to suggest, you know, making those those muscles imbalanced? I'm not 100% sure of the answer to that question, but you know, for somebody who has poor patellar tracking because of this issue here, I think as Zach suggests, it's more manageable because what you can do is you can work on strengthening the internal medial quadricep muscles a little bit more. If it's a skeletal structural, a skeletal structure, problem, I think maybe that's not as easy to deal with. I don't know how, how common this is these days, but they're called A-frames or A-bars or whatever. My brother used to wear these. And uh, like kids who have maybe knee problems or things when they're really little, they would have their legs here and then they have these little braces that go from here to here. And they walk or they have they have their shoes have a little a little brace or a little bar between their shoes like that. And it would provide a force that eventually would, because of Wolf's Law, would eventually change the angle of inclination of the femoral neck. Then that would be one way to alter the skeletal structure. But I mean, everybody's hips are different widths and you can see it when you're, you know, people watching at Fenway Park, everybody has a different hip structure. So those individuals who do have a wider Q angle may be at potential increased risk for poor patellar tracking issues. And how do you fix that if it's a skeletal thing? I don't know if it's necessarily possible. And I don't know enough about the physical therapy or the intervention about that, to be honest. I, I can't speak to that. What are the potential probability that everybody's Q angle or everybody's femoral neck or the strength between everybody's vastus medialis and vastus lateralis is, um, is correct or is ideal or is bilaterally similar? I would say that it's probably not the case that everybody has, you know, the perfect, uh, the perfect um, variables there. So the potential mechanism for injury or mechanism for knee problems, especially with, you know, and now you have these, these Fitbits and you, you know, you're supposed to take 10,000 steps a day and it's like the new craze and I got this phone and the, this watch and the watch tells me I got to take more steps. But I mean, that's not necessarily taking into account that some of these people are taking more steps with an imbalance in their muscle forces or with Q angles. And I think that, you know, before you start any bout of physical activity, you should do your physical activity readiness questionnaire. You should do your lifetime, you know, your medical history, your lifetime evaluation, and just get an understanding of the, you know, age and and bone density information. And otherwise, even though you think that you're doing a benefit, it could be the case that you're causing other problems down the line. And you didn't even really know that that was, that you were gonna cause that problem. A lot of times in the gym, I'll see, um, now the girls that are in the gym, sometimes you'll see they'll do like squats 
and they'll have like a weight in each hand here. And as they're doing their squats, you see they, um, they have their knees bent, but their knees are bending kind of like this, where their knees are buckling in a little bit. You know, you see that like the, the kneecap is kind of like collapsing inwards like that. And that's gonna falsely increase this Q angle, or it's gonna make it so that there's more force on one side of the quadricep than the other. So making sure that they have, um, you know, arch supports if they need them, or I keep, you know, reminding everybody, make sure that your knees bend in the direction of your toes. If I'm working with young athletes who've never done squats or RDLs before, one of the things I look at is the way their feet interact with the ground, the way that their knees bend and try to start with very low weights and build up, um, you know, with, with low weights and start to get a little bit more intense, but making sure that technique is sound. And right now I have young kids, 10, 11, 12 years old. I don't even care how much weight they lift. All we do is things with three pound weights and I just watch technique and try to make it so that their technique is sound. So I'm not causing more of a problem by, by having um, one quadricep muscle become overdeveloped. Another thing that we haven't even mentioned really is the stiffness of these muscles, right? If one muscle is stiffer than the other, stiffness is the resistance to stretching or strain. So if one muscle is stiffer than the other, it's also going to cause potential changes in the way that the patella is tracking through the patellar groove. So you have a, a difference in muscle magnetism. You have a difference in structure. You have a difference in technique. And you could also have a difference in the actual um, stiffness com component of the material itself that is going to lead to potential issues with patellar tracking. Now that's not overuse. Those, none of these are overuse injuries necessarily, because if they were overuse injuries, everybody who overused, everybody who did a hypermarathon, everybody who did triathlons would be injured, but it's not overuse. It could be the case that one person runs a marathon with equal magnitude or the correct magnitude and strength between these muscles. And if that's the case, maybe they won't have a problem. It could be the case that somebody's running a marathon with a high Q angle. And if that's the if that's the case, then there could be a problem, right? It's not just overuse that's causing the problem. It's overuse with one of these overarching kinesiological imbalances or irregularities that is going to lead to the problem, all right? So there's a number of mechanisms that we can discuss that are all sort of related to the same phenomenon here that you can use vector addition to postulate or hypothesize or even provide solutions but they're all different um, uh, kinesiological or bio, biomechanical mismatches that are leading to those issues. All right, so, so far what we've talked about is we've talked about the mechanism for injury at the kneecap. Um, one of them is associated with imbalanced muscle forces. Another is associated with skeletal structure in, in the sense that you could have a higher or a lower Q angle. Another one is associated with um, potential structural issue here at the femoral neck. And another mechanism of injury we discussed was the change in stiffness component of, of each of these muscles. And I guess the last thing is technique itself. If you're doing squats and you're buckling your knees in, uh, obviously you can see that there's going to be a technical um, issue that could result in, in very similar feeling knee pain.